Hello, everybody. Thank you for getting me out of Washington, D.C. <laughs> it's always a special pleasure. I'm here today with one of my colleagues, Katie Solentrop, here in the front row, who is our Director of State Support. You're going to be hearing from her in a minute. She knows everything, and I just sort of follow in her footsteps. So we're going to do a sort of a two-pronged presentation. There are a few seats up here, and incidentally, if anybody wants to come and come and sit down. Um, I hope we can have a bit of a discussion. It's not, it's not, it's a large group and a wonderful group, but not immense. And so if you all have any questions or comments as we go, I certainly welcome, you know, a raised hand. If we get too off track or too out of time, I might sort of accelerate the pace, but why don't we try and have a little interaction as we go. I want to begin by acknowledging the debt of the national campaign to President and Mrs. Clinton. This organization is almost 20 years old, and we started in response to a call by President Clinton in the 1995 State of the Union Address. This was the one that went on for about an hour and a half. Do you all remember that? <laughs> Um, I was just finishing up the report that uh, was mentioned on unintended pregnancy at the Institute of Medicine, and I was sort of passed out on my bed watching the State of the Union address, and about two-thirds of the way through, the President started speaking about adolescent pregnancy. And he said, it is the most serious social problem affecting the nation, which I was just gobsmacked. I'd never heard a President speak about this issue at all. And he said, government alone can't solve this problem. And he called for a private sector effort to unite parents, businesses, people nationwide in what he called a national campaign against teen pregnancy. And a year later, our group had its first board meeting and organizational sort of start off. So I feel a special uh, uh, gratitude to uh, him and to Mrs. Clinton, who continues to work with us some, very busy lady, uh, for our genesis. It was a wonderful way to start and um, gave us visibility and access to people and funders and media and so forth right from the get-go, and I think it made a huge difference. I want to thank you all here for coming today. Uh, this is a particularly interesting topic to me, obviously. I've been working on it one way or another for years. But look at how many of you are here expressing similar interests. It's wonderful, and I appreciate it, and I hope that our discussion today will deepen your interest and maybe give you some ideas of ways to help. Here's the key picture. The United States has the highest rate of teen pregnancy and birth in the entire industrialized world, higher than Canada, higher than virtually all of our trading partners in Western Europe, higher than many of our trading partners in Asia. Do you know which country has the lowest rate of teen pregnancy as best as we can tell? Does anybody know? Pardon me? It's South Korea. It is in Asia. Some of the lowest rates are in Asia. So we're going to talk about the progress that's been made, and indeed that's heartening and important. But I don't want you to get confused about the fact that we've got this thing licked. We are still huge outliers in this area that we're going to be talking about today. That's point number one. Point number two, uh, and if you take nothing else away today, this is something I hope to sort of get in your head intensely, is that the reason I, I want to talk to you today and the reason I think this is important is because this issue is part and parcel uh, of our enduring national struggle with poverty, child poverty, limited educational attainment, limited economic opportunity, limited economic competitiveness. So anybody in this state who cares about any of those issues should care about adolescent pregnancy. It's not the only thing, but that is where it is properly lodged as an issue of social policy. Avoiding teen pregnancy doesn't guarantee success in life, doesn't guarantee it. But when it does occur, it makes it very, very hard to succeed in life. It's not a death sentence. It's not the worst thing that can happen to people. But it limits opportunity in a very profound way. And that's why our group came into being. 
We're going to go through a few things, you know, sort of what the big picture is, what's going on, why we should care, and what to do. Uh, I hope I'm going to kind of rip through this because I really do want to talk with you about it, not just sort of lecture. As I mentioned, the national campaign is almost 20 years old, and these are the kinds of things we do. We're very dorky. We're very research-based. I'm not sure you can be in a think tank at Washington unless you're like a complete and total wonk. So we do that. We pride ourselves on working with unusual partners. We try to work with the entertainment industry. We try to work with businesses. We work with the child welfare system. We work with juvenile and family court judges. All sorts of people who have deep concern about this but don't sort of get out of bed every day and say, I'm really interested in you know, teen pregnancy or family planning or whatever. As is true for us all, isn't it? We're increasingly media-based. When we started, I used to say to people, you know, we, we have a problem. We're this little group in Washington, and we can't go to door to door handing out pamphlets to people. You know, how are we going to reach them? Now, we can reach people through, of course, online social media. The, the, the ground has shifted. We are bipartisan. We are big tent, meaning we work with people of lots of different ideas and persuasions and faiths and background and personal experiences. And we treasure that and mean it deeply. We sort of do two things when you sort of strip it all down. We try very hard to influence cultural values and messages. A lot of this issue is centered in our heads. What's normal? What's expected? What's cool? And we do try very hard to strengthen national, state, and local programs. There are things to be done, and we're going to be talking about those, Katie in particular. And we want people to know what works, what doesn't work, and kind of what to do. I'm very practical. I'm a mother of three and now a grandmother of two and a half. So I'm like, you know, what's for dinner, right? What's for dinner? Here's the good news nationally. The teen birth rate decreased 52% between 1991 and 2012. I can think of no other major sort of social marker or public health or even just phenomenon that has gotten that much better. Can anybody think of anything that's gotten that much better in these last 20 years? Someone said to me that um, violent juvenile crime might have decreased a similar amount. But I mean, this is phenomenal. So we had a big party a few months ago in Washington to celebrate the good news. And you'll love this, we handed out decks of cards because there are 52 cards in a deck. Yes. The teen pregnancy rate, which of course is not the same as a birth rate, decreased 44% between 1990 and 2009. We don't have more current data. But the point here is that this is a sea change and a very important marker. The Wall Street Journal called the reduction in teen pregnancy a rare public health victory, and indeed it is. The decline has been seen in every single state, in every single racial and ethnic group, and in every age breakdown of adolescence. So it's not just sort of New York and California and Texas, or you know, just suburban white girls, or just you know, whatever it is. It's all over the place. Arkansas has made progress as well. And you know, we'll be talking about things that still need to be done. But please understand, you've been doing something very right for the last number of years. The teen birth rate has decreased 43%. I understand it's not 52%, but 43% is nothing to sneeze at, especially in a state that is relatively poor and has a large number of higher risk young people. The teen pregnancy rate as well, as you see here, decreased. Now, on the national level, though, as I said, it's still not over. We still have the highest rate in the industrialized world. Three in 10 girls get pregnant at least once in this country before their 20th birthday. I say at least once because some of these young women have two, if not three babies by the time they reach their 20th birthday. So that is still a very serious problem. And nationwide, about 2,000 teen girls are pr get pregnant every day, like this very minute. I think that's more than one a minute. In the US, about 720,000 teenage girls get pregnant every year. About 722,000 every year. Now, as we mentioned, in Arkansas, the progress has been a little bit slower than nationwide. You have about 12 teens giving birth each day in this state. And only one county in the entire state has a teen birth rate that's below the national average. So you are a higher risk state, you know that, that's not news to you. 
Here's something you may not know. The vast majority of teen pregnancies and births are to teenagers who are 18 and 19. Remember, they're still teens. They are four times more likely than teens 15 to 17 to have a baby. Now, I know, I susp is this news to you, most people just sort of, yes, no? No, okay, so we've got the, we've got the well-informed here. In, for less informed audiences, they simply cannot believe that. There is an image that I can't, I can't quite figure out why this is, I've wondered about it for years, that it's all those 15-year-olds or 14-year-olds or 16-year-olds who are getting pregnant. And mind you, that also happens and it's very serious. But this phenomenon, this rate that we track is driven by 18 and 19-year-olds. We're almost through the data. Here's your county map. The one white county, does, what's the name of that county? I'm an out of state, you all have to help me out. Clark, Clark County. That is the only county that um, has a rate that's less than 30, teen birth rate. As you see, concentrated in the Delta and other parts of the state, you see that variation. Now, I don't want, I don't want to overstate, I just wanted to anchor it in place, but you know, sometimes these numbers are small, and so just a few fluctuations, just a few numbers in a county can you know, change these rankings. But that sort of gives you an idea of where the hot spots are. I was just asked on a radio interview earlier today, why is it that the rate is so high in Arkansas? Or maybe hasn't gone down as fast, maybe that was the question. There are many reasons, but I think one of them is that Arkansas is a largely rural state. And we do know from recent work that our group released just within the last year, that adolescent pregnancy and childbearing is more common amongst rural teens than urban teens. So when you have a state that has large rural, a large rural presence, as you certainly do here, you can just predict almost that they're gonna have a higher than average rate of teen childbearing. Well, you know, why is that? Uh, you would be in a better position to comment about your own rural communities. Certainly health services are often less accessible, less present. Um, there is more of a tradition of early childbearing in low-income rural communities than there is in urban areas where there may be more jobs, more opportunity, more reward given to education-based um, jobs and so forth. But as a general matter, the teen birth rate is in rural co communities is about a third higher than in the rest of the country. There's also some evidence in Arkansas and some other places that part of it is that rural teens have sex earlier and that they use contraception a bit less. So those are some of the reasons that we think that Arkansas, so it, it reflects your demographics, it reflects the nature of the state. I'm just about to sort of change to a different topic. Are there any numbers issues or any of this um, sort of background demographics you'd like to ask about or comment on? Yes. Um, does your organization do any studies on that breakdown, uh, depending upon sex education and specifically, well first, whether you have sex education, and second, whether it's comprehensive versus abstinence only? We will get to that a little bit later about school-based programs, and the answer is yes, we do. So we'll, we'll talk about that. I'd like to just table that a little bit for just a bit. Yeah. Are the reporting standards the same throughout the state? Is every county expected to report the same way, or is Clark County reporting on their own in their own way? I'm gonna ask Brad Plainy perhaps to comment on that. It's an important issue how things, are, how things are reported. People don't always use the same definitions, and they just have different systems. So it's never an exact portrait, even if they say it is. Dr. Center, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the reporting is based on birth certificates, so it should be the same statewide. Nationwide. Nationwide, excuse me. Yes, last question, then we'll move on, please. Uh, hi. I had a question. When you report teens uh, having children, do you also look at to see which teens are married, mm -hmm. saying that we're more of a rural state? You know, the proportion of teens who are married nationwide is very, very small. It tends to be under 10%. 
And I think even almost more significantly, at least from my point of view, what we've never understood is how many of those marriages occurred after pregnancy was confirmed. We used to call those sort of shotgun marriages. <laughs> Wait, awful phrase. So I think it's it's a relatively small uh, contributor to this phenomenon. It's not zero though, and it's an important point. In some communities, being married and having a baby at 19 is very normal and just fine. So we always need to be very careful about that. I appreciate the comment. All right, our next sort of section is why do we care about this? I mean, why why are you all here? Why do we care so much about this? And I wanted to begin with a perspective that I've come to kind of late in life. Those are frames. I think that we fail often in this field to frame the issue of adolescent pregnancy in at least what I increasingly think is the most constructive way. Too often in particular, when people make presentations or work in this field, they start talking immediately about remedies. You know, we're, we're gonna do this in fifth grade and we're gonna do that in the church youth group and we're gonna do that and so on and so forth. For people who work in this field every day, or as we say, get out of bed every morning to reduce teen pregnancy, that's a very normal conversation. What are we gonna do and which model do you use? Do you use the South Carolina one or do you the one they're working on? And uh. But for the vast majority of people, this is not their daily job. It's not their obsession. And I think that we don't spend enough time explaining why are we doing this at all? Or, I, as my husband used to say, he would gather our little girls onto his lap when there was some issue, and he'd say, ladies, why are we here? <laughs> like, what are we, are we talking about grades? Are we talking about chores? I mean, what are we talking about? And I, I really do think that the place to begin, again, for people who don't do this every day, is why are we here? What, what, what is going on? What brings us together? What's at stake? Here's how the campaign itself talks about it. This is a little truncated. This is our mission statement. But we talk about doing this to improve the lives and future prospects of children and families. And in particular, to help ensure that children are born into stable families who are committed to and ready for the demanding task of raising the next generation. We talk a lot about decreasing poverty educational attainment, and so forth. Now, a lot of people are interested in those issues, basically strengthening child and family well-being. And there are many ways to do that. Our way is to reduce teen and unintended pregnancy, especially among single young adults. But we would never say this is the only way, and sometimes it's not the most important way. Lots of people work on this stuff. They work on literacy, they work on school reform, they work on uh, you know, all, the, all the things we all care about. Earned income tax credits, minimum wages, job training programs. We don't assert that ours is the most important, but we see it in this bigger frame. And my, I would commend to you talking about it in that way, or as I said, framing it in that way. Let's go into just a little bit more. Compared to children, this is a child thing, a lot of the impact of teen pregnancy is born by the children. Children who are born to older mothers, just 20 or 21, I'm not talking about 35, 20 or 21, they are much less likely, these children of older mothers, to drop out of high school, become teen parents, use Medicaid and S-CHIP, experience abuse and neglect, enter the foster care system, sons entering prison, being raised in single parent families. So the point is that when you reduce teen pregnancy, the children are at lower risk. And it's these kinds of issues that have been now quite well documented and our group, among other things, talks about a lot. A lot of people don't understand this stuff. And you can't just assume that everybody gets this. Here's one of our favorite sort of summaries of this. A child born to a teen mother, again, we're focusing on the young baby. A child born to a teen mother who has not finished high school, is not married, that child is nine times more likely to be poor than a child born to an adult who has finished high school and is married. So for those three factors, you get increased risk with one, with two, and with three. Nine times more likely to be poor. I think that's pretty impressive. 
So this is why, among other things, we talk about this as a poverty reduction issue. One of the main ways that teen childbearing places the mother and the baby at risk of poverty, of course, is that it frequently interrupts education. Pregnancy and parenthood is not the leading cause, but it's a major cause of girls dropping out of high school. And yet I find all the time, I go around the country and I meet with people who work on high school dropout, and I say, and what are you doing about preventing teen pregnancy? They go, oh, well, I know. We're doing mentoring, we're doing tutoring, we're doing, I got, I got all that. Love it, love it. In addition, how about this? Less than 2% of mothers who have children before the age of 18 have a college degree by 30. Now, 50 years ago, that might have been okay. That's the, the world has changed. It's not so much that humans have changed, although that's, some of us have too. The economy now requires a high school education and two to four years of advanced training. Maybe we don't like that. Maybe we wish it weren't so. But that's the way it is, and it is our responsibility to tell the truth. The reason we want people to prevent, or postpone rather, pregnancy is largely because of this. The chances of getting a good job with benefits or anything are very, very small if you don't have a high school degree. And as we said, it's one of the leading causes of girls dropping out of school and out of community college and for boys as well because when they become young men, they are often slapped with child support enforcement responsibilities that then make it impossible to pay the community college tuition. In my view, anything that gets in the way of education these days should be considered a national emergency. Not because that's the way we'd all necessarily want it to be, it's because it's the way the world economy is growing, is going. And remember, this disparity between people who don't have a high school degree, their jobs and income, and those who have more training has gotten ever larger. If you wanted your hair to fall out or stand on end or whatever it is, go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and look into the earnings for people with varying levels of education. It is an emergency. Child welfare, almost half of girls in foster care, half of girls in foster care become pregnant at least once by age 19. Do any of you work in the foster care se sector? Yeah, you probably know this issue well. Compared to mothers age 20 to 21, young teen mothers were two, over two times more likely to have their child placed in foster care during the first five years of its life. And so it goes. This also costs a lot of money. In 2008, teen childbearing cost Arkansas $143 million. I can't imagine what it is now. It's gone down some, but the costs have gone up, so there we are. Most of the costs are associated with, with uh, services for the child. 34 million of it was for public health costs, 11 million for child welfare costs, 21 million for increased incarceration costs, and 45 million in lost tax revenue due to decreased earnings and spending. When we reduce teen pregnancy and childbearing, we also save money. The one-third decline in the teen birth rate in Arkansas that we talked about earlier resulted in saving taxpayers an estimated $72 million in 2008 alone. I know sometimes people don't like to talk about these things in terms of money, but I also know what it's like to work in cash-strapped states and with elected officials, and this is one platform on which we can discuss this issue. Now, the reason I think it's important to make these connections with taxpayer costs, child welfare, high school, all this stuff, is because among other things, it means we can bring more people in. If I envisioned an ideal coalition in this state or anywhere else working on reducing teen pregnancy, I would want the education sector there in big, big time because it's education, as we've been talking about, that's one of the principal losses when teen pregnancy occurs. The education sector should care about this intensely. So also should businesses who are trying to attract workers to the state, so also should all the human services, child advocates, the community college people, all these people 
live the consequences of this issue every day, and they should not be exempt. This should not just be the public health department. No offense, Brad, I love the public health department. <laughs> they can be the leaders, but this is something that touches us all. And in particular, in my experience, when we talk about reducing teenage pregnancy and childbearing in terms of education, economic well-being, poverty prevention, family structure, and more, we bring more people to the table. If we, and not that anybody here does this, but if we just start coming out and start talking about condoms, we are dismissed. We're dismissed. It, it, people are sensitive about it. They don't like it. It offends them. Uh, blah, blah, blah. We may, farther down the road, get to conversations about what's done about contraception with young people, and I will in just a second. But why begin with the one thing that we know drives people to the corners? Why don't we start talking about why we care about this thing in the first place, how much it costs, what's at stake for the state in terms of workforce quality and economic competitiveness? When we have more people who care about it, there's more of a chance, I'm not a Pollyanna, I know this is tough stuff, but there's more of a chance of making progress. This is a little drawing that I made a few years ago that I take with me when I have the, the misfortune to have to go to Capitol Hill and talk to legislators, oh my lord. I realized that this model I had in my head about how all this kind of works was idiosyncratic to me and probably half of the people in this room, but not to the larger public. And let me explain to you. The dotted line is the becoming pregnant. So let's say it's a moment of conception. There is an enormous lobby in this country for people who work on the right side of the dotted line. All the people who care about pregnant women, all the people who want to do WIC and home visiting and you know, early intervention, all that stuff. And all the infant mortality people. And then we have all the birth, childbirth, early infancy, early head start, home visiting, graduates of neonatal intensive care units. Then we get into preschool and early childhood education and home supports and parent, you know, blah, blah, all the way through. This is an enormous sector in the US and God love them as I do. I mean, this is very important. What nobody seems to want to understand is that if we could get the left side of the dotted line a little more organized, things would go a lot better on the right side of the dotted line. But for a variety of reasons, all the concern about children, families, pregnant women, babies, everything, starts with a six-week pregnant woman. And I understand that. I Believe me, I understand that. I just want us all to back up a few weeks and say the beginning is not the positive pregnancy test. The beginning is when, with whom, and under what circumstances a couple consciously chooses to start a family. That's the beginning. And that's the stuff a little bit on the left side of the line. In many parts of the world, this is all sort of the same stuff. I mean, people concentrate on different things at different life stages and people go through it, but if there's not this cement wall. It doesn't start with a positive pregnancy test. That's point number one. Point number two, and I, I hate to mention the abortion word, but let's just head right on into that and then I'm gonna turn it over to Katie. Abortion occurs on the right side of the dotted line. It's something that is done often in early pregnancy. When you get the left side of the line under control, unintended pregnancy decreases and therefore abortion decreases. 95% of abortions in the US are obtained by women who are upset about their pregnancy and say, I did not want to become pregnant at the time I became pregnant. A few percent seek abortion for genetic defects and, and very serious medical conditions. About 95% had trouble on the left side of the line. If somebody wants to decrease abortion, the only way that we have found internationally that works is by increasing attention to the left side of the line. I've often thought that the strongest advocates of family planning should be the pro-life community, just saying. Um, so, I, I, yes, excuse me. Earlier you said you, you doubted unusual partners. 
Oh, so you, earlier you mentioned that you have unusual partners. Yes. And the most unusual partner that sprung to my mind was anti-choice folks. And I'm wondering whether you do, in fact, have partners. You know, we do. It's gotten harder in recent years than it used to be, which I'm very sorry to say. We have a Catholic priest on our board. We have worked uh, in a number of settings with pro-life individuals, and I, I do that with great affection and respect. Um, I think what has happened, th this is, I, I don't have real data for this, but I feel it intensely. I think what has happened in the last number of years is there's been a sort of a confusion, a confusing between prevention, contraception, or abstinence, and or abstinence, and intervention. There's been a kind of a blur, it's like it's sort of all the same thing. Well, it isn't all the same thing in my view. Uh, we are making actually a lot of efforts in our own organization to try to make very conscious efforts to engage more pro-life individuals in the prevention agenda with mixed success. It seems to be a very difficult time right now for all the reasons we know. It's a very contentious time, but that is one sector that we're deeply interested in and have worked hard on for many, many years. My final comment, and then I'm turning it over to Katie. She's going to tell you what to do about all this. Um, Please remember again that preventing teen pregnancy in and of itself is not some magic answer to all the ills of America. The way I think of it is it sort of opens up some space. It opens up an opportunity. But if the schools are lousy, there are no jobs, there's nothing going on at all, I'm not sure what the case to be made is to postpone having a baby. If a woman with no opportunities, no prospects, no jobs, nothing, isn't 17 but gets to 20, there might be a bit of a gain simply because she's older. She might be a slightly better parent, blah, blah, blah. But the real gain happens when the, we get it correct on the left side and we open up an opportunity for other sectors to do their job. But we mustn't be confused about the notion. We mustn't say that well, if we just get the rate down, that's going to solve all these other problems. These other sectors of schools and jobs and opportunity and all the things we all know about, they also have to step up to the plate. We mustn't oversell the power of this, just as we mustn't undersell it as well. So let me step down now, and Katie's going to go through a few things that we've learned about ways to help. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. In your view, the left side time frame starts when a couple make a conscious decision to start a family. What about all the accidental pregnancies who have no intention of having a family? I didn't mean to suggest that the whole left side was, I said that to me the beginning is, it's essentially when people get pregnant, let's just say it that way. And you're quite right, in this country, about half of pregnancies are unintended, and in some communities it's much higher than that. So, to me, my view about that is that we need to talk a lot more about relationships, this choice of sex, no sex, this choice of contraception, no contraception, and bring a lot more attention to the seriousness and the stakes there. But we shouldn't just wait till somebody's pregnant to get all exercised about all these services and all these activities. We need to do all of them. I'm not saying we shouldn't do the stuff on the right side of the line. I'm saying that the beginning and the way to really get a grip on this is a little bit earlier than we currently are willing to embrace, at least in public. Uh, I often say that, in my view, getting pregnant, burying children, and raising a family is probably the most important thing that any of us ever does. It has generational impact and it's very expensive. And the notion that someone says, well, I just wasn't thinking about it, it just sort of happened, I just sort of, I mean, that to me is just, it, it doesn't um, match the seriousness and importance and joy of the enterprise. So we need to bring all this caring and love and money and attention and laws and block grants and all this stuff on the right side, which I love, it needs to embrace some of the left side as well. Thank you. And I'm sure we can bring Sarah up for more questions at the end. But I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, given all of this, what can we do? And I'm going to share some examples from other states and communities and what they've done. 
Um, I think the first step um, is to recognize that the problem hasn't been solved. As Sarah said, despite the fact that we've had a 52% decline in the teen birth rate as a nation, we still are huge outliers. And so I, I know when we got the good news that the birth rate had declined by more than half, we said, okay, are we done? Do we pack up shop and declare victory and go home? And when we looked at the data, we said, well, well no, we're, we still have so much work to do. Um, teen girls in our country are still getting pregnant at such higher rates than other countries. Um, we still need to work on this and agree that it's an issue worth addressing. Time and resources are in short supply, as everyone knows. So we need to make sure that everyone's on board. And then get everyone involved. Um, there's a great example, and I'm, I'm sure some folks have already heard about this, of some work that's been done in Milwaukee. It's been led by the United Way. They um, gave a 10-year support to, to begin addressing teen pregnancy. What they did is they really got everyone in their community involved. So they had a teen pregnancy prevention oversight committee that was chaired by um, their director of public health, Bevan Baker, and by the president of the local newspaper. And that's a little bit of an unusual pairing to bring in the local newspaper sort of at the beginning. And what that did is it gave them an opportunity to really raise awareness of the issue in the community. The local newspaper took this issue on as a, um, for a whole 12 months from their editorial board. So every month they wrote articles about teen pregnancy in the city and they started getting everyone talking about it. And now when you talk to their public health um, department um, head, he says even the cab drivers in Milwaukee know about teen pregnancy. They'll talk to you about it. They, they know sort of that there's been success in their community. They know that it was an issue. They know there's all these programs that are being done. They got the faith community involved. They have a faith collaborative. Um, and we're not, to, we're not suggesting that faith leaders need to go out and necessarily do programs, but they can have an enormous influence on the young people and the parents in their lives. And so just talking about saying that this is an issue we believe is worth addressing, and there's a variety of different ways we can address it. Again, getting parents involved, nine out of 10 parents agree that when it comes to talking about sex with their kids, they don't really know what to say or how to start it, but the vast majority of teens say that parents are where they would like to get more information. And so how can we help parents, how can we better equip parents to talk about their values with their teens? They don't have to become sex educators, but just letting teens know what they think about this. Um, you know, involving parents in parent education programs, hosting open houses to invite them, having media campaigns, encouraging them to talk to their kids, starting from a young age, just about, you know, that they expect they'll be in a stable relationship. What does a healthy relationship look like? Um, what do they hope that their um, children will have in terms of a family and, and, and how important that is? The media, um, Milwaukee had a giant media campaign and they've sort of, um, done different media campaigns over the years. They're entering their sixth year. They've had a, a more than 50% reduction in their teen birth rate just in five years. Um, and their goal was 45%. So they already reached their goal and they're moving forward more. Um, and, and they will credit meet a lot of their public awareness with that. I think meant much of it they got donated from an uh, ad company. And they just, they just released a new campaign about sex myths. And so they use youth to inform these campaigns. As the Bevan Baker told me, if we like it, it probably doesn't mean that it's resonating with youth. And they did something, I think, we often say listen to youth, but we'll, what Milwaukee did is they listened and then were brave enough to do what the youth told them, which I think takes it to a whole never, another level, right? Like we hear what youth say and we're like, well, we can't really do that, we'll get in trouble. And Milwaukee said, all right, we're trusting you on this one. And they got big, um, big returns on that. They've also developed a public-private collaborative for funding and raised quite a bit of funding that way. I think having the United Way as one of their key leadership partners really helped, but they also got, um, you know, they've been using some of the federal um, teen pregnancy prevention money to help do programming in schools. They've really used that to build the capacity of their teachers. They've gotten private donations to help do other, fund other areas and they sort of pool it all together and then youth serving organizations in the community can apply um, to use that funding. I think one of the things that they've done very well in Milwaukee and in some other communities is that they've invested in effective evidence-based strategies. Um, there are over, you know, we have a list of programs at work. So those are sort of programs where there's a teacher and a student 
There's over 30 of those that we know work. We also know that there are best practices for clinical settings, for making sure that youth have access to the best contraceptive methods. Um, and they, we've learned a lot about, about this recently, especially with projects in St. Louis and other areas around the country, you know, um, counseling on the most effective methods of contraception first and sort of going from there, not just pushing um, pills to start. So this includes both evidence-based so evidence programs both in school and after school. They're in Tulsa, they really have started pushing this. They have um, gotten programming in four schools to do evidence-based programs, and then they're hoping to expand from there. And so I think they were very excited to even have an evidence-based program that they could use in four pilot sites and are very encouraged. They've got no parental pushback. Um, the same thing happened in, with some folks in San Antonio. They started very small. They started in a few schools. And once the other school districts saw that it was going well, they called up the, the people who were providing the programs and they said, we want you to come here. Like, we're, we see how this is going. And, you know, they've been very open with school boards and saying, here, come look at the curriculum we're using, having parent information nights. And what we found in our work is that you can use these evidence-based strategies. You just have to do so in a transparent way. And again, we can always add to our evidence as well. Um, another idea is go digital. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, we're increasingly media-based. We, teens can, they get so much information online. I mean, they're digital natives. They, they can't imagine a world where you can't access things via Google. I mean, they, they sort of never had to go to the library card catalog and look up an encyclopedia. They're like, what are you talking about? So how can we get, the, the challenge I think that we're facing, and teens are probably much better at this than we are, is there's so much information that they can get online. How do they filter it? How do they find good information? So how do we, as folks with sort of appropriate and accurate information, get it to teens in a way that they want to consume it? Um, you know, a lot of it is video based now, and how do we make it? You know, we've, we have a website called bedsider.org for 18 and to 29 year olds, and we spend a long time just trying to get it on the first sort of page of Google search so like when you typed in contraception, now Bedsider comes up on the first page. It's not the first one yet. But you know, how do you optimize that? And it, there's a lot of best practices you can work on there. But how do we get the correct information to teens? Sarah spent a lot of time talking about connecting teen pregnancy to other policy priorities. And I'll just give you a great example. Um, in Mississippi, they, um, your neighbor to the right, um, have a governor who's very interested in increasing the economic power of the state. They released a report called Blueprint Mississippi that said, here's how we're going to build the economy of our state. Teen pregnancy was in there, which is one of the first times we've ever seen teen pregnancy sort of listed as a way, and it was specifically under, we're going to increase um, educational attainment, specifically post-secondary education, and we're going to, you know, one of our strategies to do that is to reduce teen pregnancies and births. So they have the governor on board for reducing teen and unplanned pregnancy as a way to increase the economic opportunity in his state. One of the things that they've done is they've used some of the federal funding that has come into the state to offer programming in schools. They've also gone around and had a lot of um, events with parents and other members of the community, town halls. So the governor sort of used his position to stump on this issue, raising awareness. And most recently, I think they've done something that's very innovative. They've connected this issue with community colleges. So there was a lot of support in the legislature to um, think about how can we improve graduation rates or student retention rates at community colleges. And they just passed a law requiring all community colleges in the state of Mississippi to have a plan for how they're going to address unplanned pregnancy. And that is something that's remarkable. You know, and it, it's really trying to get at this. They recognize that older teens, the 18 to 19 year olds, were responsible for most of the teen births in their state, and they also recognized that getting that post-secondary education was critical so that the community colleges really need to have a focus on if we're doing all these other remedies to keep kids in class, how are we also going to approach this? Um, so that, that is key. And I think um, that sort of this is just a demonstration of how they, they uh, how teen and unplanned pregnancy prevention sort of tapped into some of the other policy priorities that were happening in the state. You know, intensifying efforts um, in areas or populations with the greatest needs. So as you know, you could see from the county map, 
Can we do something per perhaps in the Delta region um, or Western region of the state to start? And, you know, going back to San Antonio, they had a, um, Texas has a lot of small counties as well, but one particular sort of southwest part of the city had the highest teen pregnancy rate in their city. And so they said, okay, we're gonna really intensify our efforts here. They applied for and were successful in receiving several federal funding projects. Um, and again, they worked with schools and worked with health clinics to really focus on this one area. And since then they've grown, there's other, organizations in the city that are focused on teen pregnancy. It's a priority of the mayor, and they sort of got all of their ducks in a row and then built out from there. They're also offering programs in unique settings, like in homeless shelters. They're working with um, parents whose kids have been um, in the juvenile justice setting, and they're, parent, they're sort of mandated to take parent education classes. One of those classes is how to talk to your kids about sex, and really it focuses on how to build a sort of communication strategy with your kid. And that's gonna help them get around all kinds of stuff, not just unplanned pregnancy. I thought that was um, very unique that they, in the court, it's a mandated court class, which is also very interesting. Um, I should say that um, the Office of Adolescent Health has funded a lot of research and demonstration projects recently for populations and areas with the greatest need. That funding, um, hopefully will continue, and if it does, will be re-competed out next year. So if you're interested in this, you know, start thinking about could we, none of that funding is in Arkansas right now, so is there a place where we can bring this? It's really focused on the evidence-based programs, but is there something we can learn from that? This goes back to, you know, thinking about the successes in Milwaukee and thinking about the of people in Tulsa and Mississippi is really, how do you use your influence in different ways? So how can, one of the um, faith leaders that we've worked with in um, Connecticut said, you know, I looked out at my congregation and so many kids were getting pregnant and then not coming back. And how can I, as a faith leader, connect with other social services and let them know that I am supportive of efforts to prevent teen pregnancy? Maybe I'm not comfortable doing it myself. But we hear all the time in communities, well, if you can get the faith leaders involved, then we'll do it. And so just saying your voice is important, and by, say, by using your influence to say, I think this is a great idea, it can open up the doors for other social services providers to come in and, um, and do, uh, offer programs and that kind of stuff. So that's the strategies I have so far, but I'm happy to talk about more if anybody has any questions. Yeah. Some questions before yeah. we wrap up. So raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you. I may pull you back up too. Okay. Yeah. My name is Angelita Thomas, and um, I have one of our leaders here, Mrs. Kim. She's there. And we're a faith based organization here in Arkansas, and it's called Teen Mops, and I have pamphlets. And we actually, every Thursday, we work with teen mothers between the ages of um, the youngest, and we've expanded it because we, what we find is that they still need help, you know, educating them and, and just teaching them about things like sex. But um, a suggestion that I have for you and what I find is working for our Team Mops group is um, hashtag um, as far as social media. Um, what's been successful for us is our Facebook page, um, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. And the gir girls have gravitated toward that. They're even to the point where they're posting inspirational YouTube videos. So what I find is, is hashtagging has been such a huge help with our social network. Um, and that's the suggestion that I have, so. Great, thank you. And There's back. a number of other questions over here. Sure. Can you talk more about the role of boys and how they play in teen pregnancy? Because so many of these programs are directed at girls, but it takes two the last time I was a teen. Sure. <laughs> I assume it's, that hasn't changed. Yeah, so. no, um, many, many, many of the programs on the list that I was talking about, the evidence-based programs are co-educational programs. They're for both boys and girls. And so the, there are even some programs that were found to be particularly effective with young men. And there's, um, there is one program 
that, well, I guess it was designed for both, but was, was much more effective with young men. So I think when we talk about evidence-based strategies, I'm not talking about just programming for girls. I'm talking about including young men in those programs. I think the biggest challenge that we have is finding um, male facilitators to help. You know, a lot of times the, the people delivering the health education are females, but we've worked with some fantastic male facilitators, and I think once you get one, they can sort of recruit in others, and they're so good at connecting with the young men. So I, I certainly agree that they're an important population to include. Right here. Can you tell me why the uh, rate of teen pregnancy declined 52%, and what have you learned from that to apply going forward? Do you want to, or do you want me to? Just one more comment about the boys. Um, I, I agree always with everything that Katie said, and it's true about the programs. Here's a counter argument. It's women who get pregnant, it's women who are often left holding the bag, and every single reversible form of contraception, with one exception, condoms, are used by women. So I think it's not crazy that people tend to focus on girls. So peace out, peace out. Uh, pardon me? I noticed that a lot of the facts are geared towards women, and it's like, how do we do outreach with yeah. everybody involved in teen pregnancy? So the question of why did the rates go down is really the important question, and the honest truth is that we are not exactly sure. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a source of angst to all of us, because if we knew exactly what was going on, we would do, say, let's do more of that and less of the things that didn't. But I can say, here's some things that probably went on. There are only two things that can change a pregnancy rate at any age. Having sex or not having sex, and then using contraception or not using contraception. At the end of the day, it's fluctuations in those that make someone or a population have more or less pregnancy. And as best as we can tell, there was some evidence over this period of slightly less ac sexual activity in adolescents, particularly teenage boys, slightly fewer reported having had sex in high school. Although given the fact that most teen pregnancies are in 18 or 19 year olds, these high school samples don't help us as much as you think they would. But there also was more contraceptive use. So it was both. It was both less sex a little bit and probably more, more contraception. We're going to talk about MTV. Yeah, but the, I think the more interesting thing is that there was a very important study just released to the National Bureau of Economic Research just a couple of weeks ago that suggested that up to one third of the decline in the teen birth rate might be traced to massive viewing of the MTV shows 16 and Pregnant and Teen Mom. And it's a very sophisticated analysis that used Google search data and a lot of stuff to, it, and Twitter, right, to assess this. But the idea is that this has been the most popular MTV show of any on that, on that very widely watched uh, uh, cable channel. And there is some evidence that young women, it got their attention because first of all, it's reality TV. It's not some scripted thing. It's not an after school special. It's not some middle aged woman telling them what to do. It's watching their own peers going through something. And they report, they say, you know, I just never, I just never saw what it might be like. So I think there is something about social norms and media and what's going on in just general culture, because along with the U.S. having had a 50% decline in teen births over this period, so have many, many other countries. There's something going on about economic trends and social norms that are very important. The rate of decline in teen births has accelerated the last few years, I mean really dramatically, so it's going down and now it's really going down. And it may be due to the Great Recession as well. Economic forces do have an impact. The fewer teen moms we have also beget fewer teen moms. We've, this started in 1991. We now have had fewer teen moms having girls who are now less inclined to it. So it's sort of, it's a self, somewhat self-perpetuating phenomenon. We have time for just these two more. I'm Suzanne Overgaard from Planned Parenthood. I'll just put that out there right away. We, uh, we know about Milwaukee's success with Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood is very strong in Wisconsin. My question would be, is there any data that STIs, also known as STDs, went down at the same time that the teen birth went down? Because a healthy population that's focusing on preventing teen birth might also be focusing on preventing STIs. You know, I, I'm not a, I haven't seen any of those data. I'm sure that the health department would have them, but I haven't seen them published. It's something we could, yeah, we could definitely, yeah, explore. 
Just one point on that, though. I, I do think that uh, one of the factors that was most influential in the 90s decline, you know, this is the thing, it's gone for 20 years, there have been different factors that are weighed in at different times. I think that, you know, in the 90s, there was an enormous amount of HIV AIDS ac activism and education, as there should have been and continue. And one of the things we saw was increased condom use in the 90s. And I think what happened was on the very, very, very short list of good things about the AIDS challenge was that it got the attention of young men in a way that pregnancy does, but not quite the same way. So I, there is an interaction in, in STDs, HIV, AIDS, and pregnancy rates. It's just not well understood over time. Yeah, and particularly parents, the attention of parents of young men, right. there, there was a real right. emphasis on encouraging their young men to use condoms, which I think has right. waned in recent years. And last one. Thank you for being here. I'm Linda Tyler, former state legislator from Conway. I'm very interested in your data on the rural aspect and the fact that we have, of course, we are a very rural state, and the data set suggests that teen pregnancy is much higher. I'm aware of a few um, programs around the country where school-based clinics are being used. Can you speak to the uh, any evidence that we have that school-based based clinics in the rural areas are affected, effective at reducing teen pregnancy? I don't know that we have any data on school-based health centers in rural areas in particular. I know we're delving into this rural analysis more to look at sort of some of the underlying complexity. There is some data coming out of um, Denver, Colorado right now about the positive impact that school-based health centers can have if they can offer contraception on site. Yeah. Let me just say another word about contraception. Uh, we haven't talked as much about it as we usually do. Remember, the only teens who are getting pregnant, the only ones getting pregnant, are the ones who are having sex and not using a really good form of contraception. They're the, they're the numerator in these rates. They're having sex and they're not using a really good form of contraception like a long-acting, low-maintenance method like an IUD or an implant. That means if you want to reduce a teen pregnancy rate, you have to affect one or both of those factors. And I do think encouraging young people to wait, encouraging young people to get out of abusive relationships, whatever, is a terrific thing to do. We also have to address those teens who are not using good contraception. And as Katie mentioned, we do know that school-based health clinics that provide contraception or are school-linked do have some impact. People may not like it, but the only thing that really, really prevents pregnancy among sexually active individuals, back to that chart, it's this choice between no contraception or really good contraception. So after all the talking and all the PSAs and all the youth development and all the everything, young people either have to not have sex or use really good contraception. And it's often both or different things at different times. But that's the biology here. That's the biology that can't be avoided. Thank you, uh, Sarah and Katie, for coming. I know there's more questions. You can please come up and interact afterwards. And uh, we appreciate you coming up. <laughs>